and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Zero Emission Solutions Conference at COP26. Our session uh, today um, is economic response towards COVID-19 resilience. My name is Guntur Sutiono from Climate Works Australia, and I will be your moderator today. And I would like to thank the SDSN for inviting us to host this session. Uh, before I introduce our panels, um, let me start by quickly refreshing again what this session is about. Um, during the pandemic and post-pandemic recovery, governments are urged to focus on green recovery. A green economy would significantly enhance the resilience of both economies and societies in the face of future economic recessions and environmental challenges. But many governments are unsure about what green economy economic recovery means for their countries, how can they demonstrate the benefit of it? And this, this session discusses why uh, green recovery is important, um, including to the developing countries, what governments can do to start the green recovery, how can we align green recovery with countries' uh, climate ambition, and most importantly, how can uh, we rethink the governance of public investment and steer it towards uh, implementing green investment policies. Um, Joining us today uh, are our wonderful panels. We have Olga Mikeva joining from London and Berli Marta Wardaya joining from Jakarta, Indonesia. Our first panel, uh, Phoebe Konduri, regretfully sends her apologies for not joining us, uh, joining with us today due to conflicting schedule with her COP agenda. However, she has shared her uh, recorded uh, presentation. And um, with that, uh, let me quickly um, perhaps in, uh, read um, her bio. So um, Phoebe Kunduri is a world-renowned environmental economics uh, professor and global leader in uh, sustainable development. She is listed in the most cited women economists in the world with 15 published books and more than 450 published peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers, um, books, uh, books, chapters, and reports. Um, she is elected a uh, member of the World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, she holds a PhD from, a, from the University of Cambridge and has been affiliated as researcher and lecturer with Cambridge uh, University College London, London School of Economics, University of Reading. And since 2006, she is a um, professor at the Athens University of uh, Economics and Business. Um, I think we are ready. Uh, so Phoebe is going to be our first uh, panel and I will introduce our other panels um, uh, shortly before they, they turn uh, to speak. And uh, again, I'd like to um, say um, welcome everyone participants and thank you to the panels today. And um, I think we are ready to uh, listen to, to uh, uh, Phoebe's speech. Oh, Phoebe's speech is about what and why green economy uh, recovery is important to create resilience. Uh, what is the risk of not doing it? How the European Union address the green economic recovery? What policies, um, etc. Okay, so I think we are ready. Um, uh, let's uh, listen to, uh, to her. Hello, everybody. My name is Vivi Kunduri. I'm a professor in economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business and co-chair of UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network Europe. We are at a point in time that we are facing many crises. The COVID-19 pandemic, the huge economic recession that derives from it, climate change crisis, biodiversity collapse. Thankfully, we have policies that are trying uh, to uh, respond to this crisis. UN Agenda 2030 with the 17 SDGs and 169 targets within these SDGs. The Paris Agreement reflecting SDG 13, 13 trying to keep global temperature increase well below 2 degrees and if possible 1.5 degree um, 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 increase uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. 2019, we also have the European Green Deal, the um, 
new growth strategy of Europe, climate neutrality by 2050, protecting uh, human life, uh, animals and plants from pollution and clean tech leadership for European companies doing this transition without leaving anyone behind. The European Green Deal is supported by one trillion um, uh, and uh, half of it uh, from the EU budget and uh, the other half to be leveraged by public-private partnerships. Unfortunately, 2020 we have the COVID-19 pandemic and we have the short-term responses together with the long-term response from the European Commission, the EU Next Generation instrument which is 750 billion in addition to the multi-annual financial framework of Europe trying to finance a green and digital recovery. So the pathway for the recovery is green and digital. The growth strategy of Europe remains green and digital even after the huge non-linearity of the pandemic. To be financed uh, from the EU next generation instrument, an investment has to be at minimum 37% climate related and 20% digitally related. And of course, 2021 is a year with many laws being drafted, implemented and transposed into national laws from European to national laws. The climate law, the first time that the um, commitment to reduction of CO2 emissions um, it becomes uh, a law and late 2020 the uh, leaders of uh, European member states agrees to an increased ambition with regards to greenhouse gas emission reductions by 55 percent until 2030 and climate neutrality by 2050. We also have the EU taxonomy identifying exactly which investments are, can be considered green climate mitigation adaptation sustainable sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, circular economy, pollution prevention, biodiversity. And at the same time, we have the proposal for a corporate sustainability reporting directive that requires auditing, introduces detailed reporting requirements, and and needs a digital tracking of the reported information. Together with this, we have the Fit for 55 package, a major uh, package with 13 legislative proposals trying to create the regulatory and legal framework for the implementation of the European Green Deal, the revision of the ETS, climate action, social facility, revision of the offer sharing regulation, revision of the land use regulation, Regulation, proposal for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, the revision of renewable energy directive, energy efficiency directive, energy taxation directive, the EU forest strategy, the revision of the directive on the employment of alternative fuels and infrastructure, and of course the revision of the regulations that have to do with mobility, cars, vans, aviation, marine time uh, space. It is great that we have this huge policy momentum, although policy documents and laws exist mainly in Europe, but there is a lot of discussion on the targets across the world, Canada, US, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and importantly, China committing to climate neutrality by 2060. And of course, we need to act fast, very fast, because we know that the latest assessment of the IPCC uh, identifies that we need to act fast because we are already very close to exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, uh, target uh, as a maximum of increase in average global temperature temperature. So what do we need to do? We have all these policies. How are we going to really implement these policies? How are we going to really implement the sustainability transition? I direct a cluster uh, for sustainability 
trying to transform research and innovation into sustainability action and puts together the research and innovation efforts of the Athens University of Economics and Business, where my profession, profession sits, the Athena Research and Innovation um, Information Technology Center, the EIT Climate Kick, which is the biggest private, public private partnership for accelerating climate neutral innovations in Europe and is partly financed by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And of course, the major strength of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the biggest network in the world that tries to communicate the technologies and innovations and research results that are producing universities and research institutions to all other stakeholders that need to implement the sustainability transition, the financial institutions, the companies, the NGOs, the civil society, and importantly, the policymakers and the politicians. I'm honored to co-chair SDS in Europe and SDS in Greece and work on research and innovation projects, innovation acceleration, deep demonstration projects, education, training, and policy interface that allow us to understand where we are and where we want to go. And uh, uh, SDS in Europe publishes every year the Sustainable Development Report that assesses the progress of each and every member state country and uh, starting to include to include neighboring countries are well with regards to the implementation of the 17 SDGs. Together with this report, every year we produce a report on the transformations needed for the joint implementation of the SDGs and the European Green Deal. And this report basically tries to connect the four major policy initiatives, the SDGs, the European Green Deal, the European Semester Process, and the EU Next Generation to support policymakers with actionable strategies that can and guide the national economic recovery in European member states in line with Europe's overreaching sustainability agenda. And of course, we know that beyond the fiscal stimulus that the EU next generation is bringing and is expected to boost aggregate demand, this crisis calls for transformative public investments that will shape sustainable, fair, green, digital transition and leverage private sector investments. We showcase with machine learning methods that the European Green Deal and the SDGs are very closely related and we also uh, uh, make um, a transposition exercise that uh, tries to find the connection between the level of the achievement of the SDGs and the recommendations of the European semester process. This is uh, the page for Greece. We have a page for each and every European member state and we find for Greece that there is 80% alignment between the difficulties with regards to implementing the SDGs and the recommendations of the EU semester process with regards to uh, making, uh, putting more effort in achieving relevant objectives. And on average, we have 72% alignment between uh, the European Green Deal uh, implementation and recommendations and uh, the SDGs. And because we have this alignment, it is uh, very helpful uh, and it uh, identifies uh, the way forward. It is good that we have different policies, but these policies are aligned. And based on this alignment, we need to sketch detailed technological and investment pathways for the actual implementation of the policies. The technologies are renewable energy, circular economy, nature-based solutions, and adaptation projects. And what we argue in this report is that the European Green Deal and and the SDGs implementation should be conceived on a systems holistic interdisciplinary approach that is definitely science driven and needs to simultaneously address multiple 
objectives and promote the right mixture of policy instruments and technological solutions that can be used across the various sectors of the economy. The report provides explicit recommendations for the power sector, for the land use sector, for the mobility sector, and it also provides recommendations with regards to the finance pathways that need to support the technologies, the implementation of the technologies. And basically what we say is that countries need to reconceptualize their financial stability and also their financial missions, both at the macro level in terms of the European Investment Fund and the European Investment Fund missions, at the meso level in terms of the national public investment organizations that need to provide sources of long-term patient finance and at the micro level companies need to understand that those that switch towards sustainable practices soon as will be the most competitive most innovative and most successful over time and of course it is important not only to sketch the financial technological and policy pathways but also to uh, care about those that are vulnerable and might face regressive effects due to climate policies. The European Green Deal will create approximately 1 million uh, jobs, most of which are highly skilled. So we need to invest in a major wave of reskilling and upskilling in order to keep the cohesion of the society and in order to have an inclusive growth. And we also showcase in our reports that those that are negatively affected from climate policies can be mitigated um, for this negative effect through um, uh, fiscal uh, policies uh, through a package of fiscal policies and we showcase this in a detailed microeconomic modeling exercise where um, we um, uh, show that the uh, redistributing climate policy revenues through lump sum taxes, implementing targeted efficiency measures, long-term job training programs, and funding of subsidies for low carbon technologies via general taxation can really achieve the implementation of climate policies, but also ensure more equality, increased GDP, and employment in all regions of Europe. I would like to close here and say that the science has spoken, climate crisis, biodiversity collapse is here, we have to face it and we have to face it fast, we have the technology, what we need now to achieve during the COP and during the other UN conferences before the end of the year is to agree on the pathways, the technological, the financial, and the policy pathways that will get each and every country where it has to be by 2030 and 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Phoebe. Uh, participants, uh, don't hesitate to post any questions uh, during the session through uh, the, using the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom um, uh, app in your screen. Uh, we'll address them after um, the all panels are uh, complete their, their speech. Now let's move on to our second uh, panel, uh, Olga Mikheva. Um, Olga holds a PhD in public administration and technology governance from Taltec Estonia and is currently a Mary Curry Research Fellow at the University College uh, London IIPP. Uh, Her research uh, work is focused on how governments can implement strategic investments in innovation and development, what policy policies and agencies are required. And uh, she has a strong interest in policy-oriented research and has recently co-authored a number of IIPP policy reports, including on the European Investment Bank's advisory support to the circular economy, and the Norway's uh, green industrial strategy. Now, Olga's speech today is about the need to rethink governance of public investments, how to strategically design and implement green investment uh, uh, policies. Now, Olga, I'm not going to, to spoil the whole story. I'm sure you have a great present, uh, great speech today. And uh, with that, uh, time is yours. Thank you very much, Gunter. Uh... Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me, for having me here today. Indeed, uh, 
perhaps building to some extent on what Phoebe has already touched in her um, talk about uh, various policy ambitious targets, a lot of strategies that are already were announced and are currently being designed in EU and across the world. I would like to bring in the question of financial governance to, to today's discussion. Um, at the moment, after governments were spending during one and a half years almost to support economies, firms, households, there are serious debates ongoing currently about post-COVID economic governance and particularly public finance, public spending, public investments. These debates are also marked by uh, very visible political events. There are national elections going on. Uh, there are changes in political coalitions. But I have to say that also these debates over post-COVID economic governance are quite sobering. What I mean by this is, for example, in the European Union, there is ongoing conversation about revising the fiscal rules that are at the core of how member states are monitored and what type of public investments within which limits they can uh, think of public spending. So the 3% of GDP in regards to budget deficit, 60%, these are major um, uh, numbers that are quite uh, important when uh, making uh, a national investment or spending decisions. Um, in developing countries, the question of obviously public finance is no less acute. High public debt is typically th thought as um, very important because it higher public debt would decrease investors' confidence. It would uh, amplify the risks of capital uh, outflight, outflows, um, foreign capital can leave these economies on a very short notice and uh, reduce economic activity even further. This type of economic reasoning leads to concrete political choices. Namely, um, there are a lot of, there is a lot of advocacy already coming and raising, uh, rising uh, in favor of fiscal consolidation. Uh, across the board, uh, across political spectrum, uh, across the world, which means basically reducing public deficits and spending and controlling the levels of public debt. Uh, this conversation, not from last year, not from next year, but from 2023. And this, this type of conversations are happening in developed, but also in um, lower income economies. For example, even given the recovery facility that we mentioned in the EU, very ambitious spending, but this is still a one time measure. What about uh, economic financial governance beyond the seven year European budgets? Um, at the Institute of Innovation Public Purpose, where I work as a researcher, we think that this economic thinking poses serious obstacles to the opportunity we all have to reconsider economic and financial governance. Because to implement the green transition, to design policies for a major structural change, we need a different type of governance mechanisms, a different type of policy interventions. And by, national, by financial governance, I mean here not only green mandates for central banks, not just green investment taxonomies, which in their own right, they can indeed help alter or change behavior of private financial agents, but only to some extent. So what I mean here by financial governance is a broader take on strategic public investments, the alignment of key public finance agencies, central banks, finance ministries, financial supervisory authorities, state investment banks, development finance institutions. The alignment of these key public financial agencies to commit long-term, therefore beyond or despite political cycles, and directly intervene and create financial markets to shift financial behavior. So that's a step beyond greening existing financial instruments or investment or business models. So in other words, not to spend the next nine years in making low carbon sectors more attractive for private finance, 
we even the European Investment Bank acknowledges openly explicitly that um, we can leave uh, the discovery of low carbon sectors to the private sector alone, but it will take way more time. Um, but this, therefore, the argument I'm trying to make, uh, and also in the work we're doing currently with colleagues at IPP, is to we need to commit also public finance to green sectors. And there are various direct and indirect instruments to do that. I would like to make three points related to this. First is that such proposition um, is not really novel. It's, it's nothing new and um, it derives it's, it's more like a conclusion from the work we have been doing with colleagues at IPP while looking in the retrospect and at the financial governance of the previous major and quite dramatic structural change, namely industrialization that occurred throughout the 20th century in most of the countries. That type of structural change was characterized by more direct role of public investments, both in developing and also in high income countries. And by structural change here, I mean a change in economic activities that dominate national regional economies. It was unthinkable that building new economic sectors, investing in new technologies, uh, making massive infrastructure available throughout the 20th century, it was unthinkable that it was all would be left to the private businesses. Second, structural change necessarily means long-term horizon for developing countries, many of which have by now been experiencing premature or negative deindustrialization there or they are uh, stuck in the middle income traps. Um, green transition can bring in the question of long-term economic strategies, for example, promoting green sectors for exports, linking green transition with the possibility to uh, to produce higher value added experts can be a possibility. Third, there are other emerging analytical frameworks that can help in rethinking public and private investments, how to realign finance with the goals or needs of productive economy. And for example, circular economy is one of such frameworks. Uh, based on our work with the European Investment Bank, and the Innovation Finance Advisory Services, we published a report last year. It, is, it was interesting to observe that circular business models, supply chains, various challenges of how to define, how to understand uh, circularity, they actually force financial sectors, particularly banks, to relearn what productive firms do to make banks understand the financing needs of the real economy. To conclude, to build and scale up green economic sectors while phasing out fossil-based activities. We need big and serious investments, obviously, um, and, but they will not happen without more strategic, more direct take on public financial governance. Economically speaking, uh, this means creating new financial technology markets and using policies to shift financial flows into carbon sectors, not just to wait and um, not just to wait and make uh, for the private sector to come in and make uh, green financial instruments or make low carbon sectors more attractive. Just like credit policies were used throughout the world to support industrial growth earlier, we need, as I keep saying again, we need also green public investments. Politically speaking, even if we continue being obsessed with public deficits, there are also various self-balance sheet mechanisms to implement public investments. Finally, what implications for developing countries? Despite being uh, oftentimes dependent on foreign aid and foreign investments, but also on, on the types of economic policies um, promoted by international uh, donors and international agencies, there are still possibilities uh, to carve out policy space for domestic green industrial strategies and green investment strategies. China is a good example using green transition as industrial policy tool, but obviously this is not to say that we need to replicate China's mode of governance. It's not possible and it might not be desirable. But despite an even global order, whereby donor countries exercise a lot of power over economic decisions in emerging and low-income countries. 
developing countries can take a broader take on green transition to deliberate over the question of justice, of the just transition, uh, to rethink the way their economies and industries are integrated into international economy, to design policies fit for local needs, to put climate into broader policies of financial stability, to use climate policies for reducing policy imports from international development agencies. It's a very difficult task though, so no illusions um, about that, given imbalances of power I mentioned. But, and, but I think it's useful to also understand that the short run costs of these types of policy decisions are very high for all, not just for developing countries, but for developed as well. Um, and for all societies, but but there is, uh, I'm afraid there is uh, really no other way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. I think we, it's it's great, it's interesting. I, I might have a, a follow up question, but I will um, uh, post it a bit later after after we uh, we finish with with Berli's speech. Now, uh, our third panel is uh, Berli Marta Wardaya. Um, he currently serves as a research as the research director of the Institute for Development of Economics and Finance, or INDEF, in Indonesia. Uh, he is also a lecturer at the Department of uh, Economics and at Planning and Public Policy Graduate Program, University of Indonesia. Um, his research uh, covers topics such as development economics, public sector finance, environmental economics, and behavior uh, economics. Now, barely coming, at, you know as comes from, from developing country, his, his speech is about why green economic recovery is important for developing countries recovery. What, uh, what opportunity presented in Indonesia, uh, what Indonesia has been so far or should be doing in, in the near future, challenges, um, et cetera. So it's, it's a bit uh, broad uh, topic, but we are happy to, to, have him, to have him here with us. And uh, Berli, uh, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you for for inviting me. Uh, it's a totally pleasure to be here and yeah, sharing uh, yeah the panel with uh, very distinguished speaker yeah, Olga and Phoebe. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, spent my my grad school in in Netherlands and in uh, Italy, so uh, have a lot of uh, and still keep in touch with the with the. Uh, the economists from from European especially yeah but I'm also happy that there are a lot of uh, participants from uh, in developing country especially in Asia and uh, Africa so let me begin yeah with uh, quoting the about uh, Shakespeare yeah uh, for developing country yeah, uh, most of the uh, the biggest question is to be sustainable or not yeah yeah because it's uh, still seen to be to be costly yeah especially for uh, for energy, yeah, coal and uh, diesel and yeah, fossil base is still seen to be the, the cheapest, especially with a country with a significant uh, deposit. Yeah, so in the yeah in the uh, three sphere of social, environment, and economic, yeah, environment are still are often uh, put on the lower ledge of uh, priority. Yeah. First, economic, yeah, as long as does not uh, create social unrest, yeah, and then environment, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, the quotation, yeah. So, uh, I think, yeah, the the credo of many developing countries is uh, give me sustainability, yeah, uh, uh, is good, uh, good plan, is good reputation, yeah, but not yet, <laughs> not yet, yeah. So that's another, uh, yeah, I think you're familiar with the quotation. Uh, so even even then, yeah, I think. Uh, some of the country already seen the or have a long term enough uh, perspective here yeah, that they uh, need to to start somewhere or uh, because it will also affect uh, their country yeah so especially uh, country in the tropical area country with uh, archipelagic uh, uh, state yeah? country with a lot of uh, potential for natural disaster uh, yeah so we see yeah like Maldives, for instance, Maldives uh, has been uh, getting some headline yeah, while uh, committed or declaring they are an endangered country, yeah, even held a, a cabinet meeting uh, underwater because that, there they will be yeah, if the change is not uh, coming enough. Yeah? Uh, so then 
uh, going back to to Indonesia. So in 2009, Indonesia is one of the few country that uh, make a commitment, commitment, explicit commitment in uh, 2009 in peace back meeting that uh, we will uh, discuss or we will try to uh, decrease uh, and reduce our our emission uh, 2000 uh, by 26 percent by by internal effort and by 45 uh, percent with uh, international support yeah so this uh, has been uh, gathering some headline and has been followed through with uh, domestic uh, effort yeah and and regulation yeah yeah so yeah but when the 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 second term of the president uh do you know that came out with the commitment uh, ended uh let's say the yeah the commitment has uh, been reduced yeah at, at, at least it's not as strong as uh before yeah and the latest uh, data 2009 yeah put indonesia in the uh, top 15 yeah i mean yeah not as large as the yeah the larger one yeah but yeah, in par with uh, Saudi, with uh, Korea, and with uh, Canada, yeah. Uh, and looking at the rate of development, yeah, some uh, emission uh, projection is not sustainable. If we uh, continue or we slack down, then uh, Indonesia with yeah could could go to or even higher than three uh, percent. Yeah, well. We actually, as uh, Ajip Lajik, we have uh, if if just five meter of uh, sea uh, sea level rise, yeah, then many of Indonesian seventeen thousand island will be disappear forever from the face of the earth. Yeah. Uh, so, looking at the data, so the the economists, especially the environmentalists, in the last uh, yeah, especially in the last seven year, has been quite worried. Uh, looking at the at the trend, yeah, where the the emission from energy from transport and forests and uh, land use has been dominating yeah there has been uh, still uh, follow uh, transfer or change from uh, forests yeah to uh, palm oil especially and to to mining yeah so with only very recently uh, last year that Indonesia changed the the uh, regulatory, yeah. Well, before it was the the authority of the local government, yeah, of the city and regency, yeah, to give out uh, license on forest use. Yeah. Now it has been uh, taking back to the uh, to the national level. So, so hopefully, yeah, we'll see less uh, less change of the land use, especially uh, tropical forest that has been uh, that uh, we have lost quite so much uh, then uh, yeah okay let's this yeah there are a lot of uh, uh, hope yeah a lot of hope a lot of uh, angst yeah in Indonesia yeah green uh, green community green green activists green uh, economists yeah that uh, we will see uh, the, the COVID yeah with uh, open new door and change Indonesia behavior yeah uh yeah especially yeah we are looking that the subprime uh, stimulus in 2008-2009 yeah is actually quite green yeah china uh lead the way in terms of the number uh but uh in terms of the proportion yeah china uh, eu and uh, korea so the stimulus has been uh, quite green in uh, 2008 and 9 yeah yeah but uh quite recent analysis yeah comparing uh comparing several countries show that uh it is india that has been managed uh in, in among developing country has been quite successful in inserting a green element into the COVID uh, stimulus indonesia uh, yeah my country has yeah it, it, on the lower rung of the ladder yeah lower rung of the ladder yeah even though yeah there are some other country that rank even lower why is that yeah i've been in contact yeah with uh several high official we have meeting we are invited yeah uh, oh, yeah publicly uh so because the, the COVID is not seen as as an as a long term is seen as a as a short term uh problem yeah that once we take away uh yeah the, yeah, the profit then we will 
uh, then the yeah it will goes back to the old normal yeah so that's why a lot of the stimulus are going uh, toward uh, demand creation yeah uh, uh, social assistance uh, social assistance to the needy to the poor uh, wage supplement yeah uh, and of course the the help yeah so we uh, yeah the yeah the yeah the community the yeah the green community has been in, yeah, yeah, my team uh, has been yeah, producing a report uh, yeah, quite recently. Yeah, how we can uh, use this this uh, this uh, uh, this crisis yeah, into a, a potential for transforming into from extractive base yeah, to sustainable base. Yeah, uh, one of the most uh, let's say yeah, that we fight the most is the subsidy, uh, passive subsidy for for biofuel. Yeah, so. Because uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the government want to reduce the import. Yeah, I mean they have less less uh, foreign currency, so they want to uh, yeah, yeah replace or reduce uh, fuel import with biofuel. Yeah, but yeah, I mean it's still burning. Uh, it's still burning. It's still producing uh, emission. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me close with the. Uh, plot twist, yeah. <laughs> so uh, in the last two three months, yeah, yeah, the green uh, systemic epistemic community in Indonesia has been very surprised, yeah. So we call it the uh, COP and G20 effect, yeah. Uh, yeah, Indonesia is yeah is uh, taking the chair of the of the G20. Uh, just and in the last couple of months, yeah, the the policy that we have been fighting for, yeah, are, are suddenly. Enacted, yeah, yeah. So suddenly, the very powerful, yeah, yeah minister of resource, yeah, uh, announced that there will be no more uh, coal power plant, yeah. Uh, Will, well, the developmentalist uh, presidency of uh, Jokowi has been uh, building uh, 20 gigabyte of uh, 20 megabyte, 20 gigawatt of uh, new uh, power plant, uh, which about, uh, yeah, about half are. Uh, Coal power, so we have been protesting that, but yeah, then very suddenly, yeah, is uh, there, there's a change of heart, yeah. This, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing a, a paper on this, and there has the state electricity company has announced the phasing out, yeah, phasing out, and just one or two weeks ago, there's a new carbon tax, yeah, carbon tax will be enacted to coal power plant, yeah, so make the coal power plant more uh, more pricey, yeah, so making uh, the, the the renewable energy more more attractive yeah and carbon market are, are currently under uh, discussion so so it's a yeah so there's a, should be an analysis of uh, saving face yeah i mean for for the japanese uh, concept of power because indonesia is yeah untrusted with big uh, big position we are very in yeah, the spotlight so uh, suddenly the star are aligned yeah so the the government changed into deliver what we have been asking even though yeah, yeah my last point that we are still uh sticking at 2060 for for net zero yeah so that's one one point that we are still still fighting for yeah to to move uh the the targeted 2050 or even 2045 yeah yeah so what i think in here yeah uh, in the lesson in the last 13 yet second is uh to know the problem is yeah to look for uh for opportunity and timing, and keep pushing, keep pushing until yeah the policymaker are uh, facing the the situation where they must bring a concrete uh, progress yeah to the global community. In this uh, case, yeah the COP and the and the G twenty. So yeah, just for all of you fighters outside, yeah keep fighting. Yeah, <laughs> things can change. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Barely, for that um, very delightful um, presentation. Um, I have a follow-up question for uh, for Olga, and and uh, thank you so much for for that uh, great uh, and inspiring um, talking points earlier. And especially, I'd like to highlight this, you know, the the role of of, of domestic banks um, in developing countries, and many developing development banks, or you know, and most often. Uh, state-owned banks in development countries are already thinking about uh, implementing uh, green investment policies, um, but they're facing a number of, of of issues. And you know, from from uh, most importantly, uh, you know, capacity issues. Uh, that's one example. And so they have this, 
you know, question or fig, trying to figure out how, how to do it, what to, what to prioritize, what is the, the first step that we need to, uh, to do uh, to, to get there. And uh, so, you know, in, in your view, um, what can you suggest uh, uh, for, for these, you know, actors to, to start uh, getting there? Thank you. Yeah, very useful question. Um, I um, let me go back to previous challenge, previous challenges of industrial transformation. They were no less uncertain for developing countries how to industrialize. They were no less complex than today. Uh, the political economy of that was also no less complex. Um, it was different, but it was no less complex. For domestic financial sector, for financial system that, for example, in Southeast Asia, it was also dominated by a lot of foreign banking groups, just for historical reasons. Um, we can draw some parallels with today, globalized financial capital, right? Um, for domestic financial sector to learn about the needs, the local needs of nascent industry, let's say that was when we talk about post-World War II, uh, it was similar, similarly challenging. And this every country, uh, some more successfully than others uh, designed and implemented how to nurture your financial institutions in such a way that they will actually act as vehicles to channel finance, private, but also let's say public, if you're a development finance institutions. I did my field work in Malaysia. They have very interesting setup of national uh, development banks. Uh, Indonesia, a lot of other countries in Southeast Asia, and yet we have some successful stories and some not so successful cases when development finance institutions ended up having acting more like a manager of soft loan schemes without necessarily doing strategic investments. So there are a variety, I don't have a clear cut answer for you, I'm afraid, Gunther, but the point here is that this, that's why there is a need for, for domestic policy space to align your financial targets with the green targets. So it's not about finance, uh, it's not about public subsidies or uh, incentives uh, to attract more foreign capital to supposedly uh, come into your emerging low carbon industries. It will not happen that way. You have to set up your low carbon industry strategy first. What would it be, how, what does, does it correspond to your longer term vision, where do you wanna go as a, a national economy? I mean, these are very important questions and I obviously am very, very well aware of imbalances in how economic ideas and policy advocacy is also very much forced on a lot of developing and low income countries, you know, guided by this mainstream economic thinking. So, so I mean, it's a kind of broader question, right? It's not just about banks, it could be domestically owned banks in developing countries, but they will be still not willing to um, go and obviously why would they? I mean, everything is still guided by short termism. Yeah, so I have another follow up on that. So you mentioned about the, you know, the importance for, to, to align with the green target, right? So it's, it's not just, you know, the we expect the banks or financial institutions just to, to change. There need to be uh, al alignment with, with the long-term uh, uh, climate or environmental target. And in this case, I want to, to, to bring that to, to the net zero, uh, for example. How, how would you see, and you know, given the, you know, the experience, for example, with the, in developed countries or in other countries, how these financial institutions can can actually link with how or how net zero is actually play a role in this in this sense? Well, if net zero is that kind of umbrella goal, but then you go kind of you descend from it and you think, well, what does net zero mean for Indonesia? I mean, um, what are the what are the 
um, qualitative but also quantifiable perhaps targets that that you can uh, you can uh, use in your political commitments medium term uh, long term um, and um, of course we also with my colleagues uh, we don't deny the the importance to give that first uh, move that these um, technocratic tools like taxonomies uh, um investment frameworks um can give that that's great but it's just it's not enough it's it's, it's a one policy tool but we, we should think in terms of uh, maybe it's just me trying to say that well maybe for many countries they should think about green industrial policy it will not be it will not be the same industrial policy they were thinking in the 50s or 60s obviously it's different but but it's still about thinking of your domestic what is net zero for you? I mean, you have to look at your economic structures. The same happens with the circular economy. It's a very well-developed conceptual framework. And I feel that it sometimes actually poses more dangers because you import conceptual framework without really analyzing, like what, it, what are those circular um, supply chains that are needed for my economy domestically? And that ha happens also in Europe as well. I mean, we can think about East, we can think about North and South divide. There are similar dependencies, lack of domestic deliberations to align uh, policy goals uh, that are imported, let's say from uh, commission's targets or from other uh, countries that were that are, that are more ahead with developing circular strategies. So importing them without really thinking, okay, what is my economic structures? What are my dominated sectors? Where I want to bring them in five years, in 10 years, 15, how circular can help me doing that? So of course it requires a lot of different types of capacities among, let's say, um, ministries and agencies that uh, structure design those policies I mean it's really not very um, it's not limited to problems of developing countries it's it's so to answer your question I mean net zero is is great as overall but still there is how to go there right I mean these are really people sitting there every day thinking okay how shall we strategize hey, thanks Olga I think that's that's actually a great segue to my next question to to Berli. So, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, what, it, what does it mean net zero for, for, Indonesia, for developing country, for, for Indonesia? And then we're, with, you know, we're talking about transitioning uh, the economy as, and Indonesia as, you know, many other developing countries also highlights the affordability um, of the transition. And uh, also considering that, um, Indonesia, like other developing countries, there are huge discrepancy, you know, disparity, economic disparity between between regions. So there is this kind of, uh, you know, affordability as well as avoiding um, uh, negative impact in, in in regions inside the inside the country. Now, my question to to, to Berli is, uh, how can Indonesia and other developing countries address this, you know, this affordability, uh, or you know? transition uh, affordably yeah uh, just before the pandemic uh, i attend uh, uh, east asia no no uh, yeah the asia pacific yeah uh, uh, meeting in in bangkok where they uh, invite policy makers and academics from all over asia pacific yeah. so we have a chance uh, to to discuss the the progress and comparing notes yeah. i think the the most common threat is uh, you need to be able to convince the, the policymaker, yeah, the government that in the end uh, is economic. Yeah, so if you do the green transformation, yes, it's not just cost today. Yeah, uh, because they have to sell it to yeah, yeah, they have to finance it, they have to find money for it, they have to sell to the parliament, they have to convince the the uh, apa namanya the industry, especially the industry that uh, will bear the cost, but they have to convince that in the end, it will bring economic uh, return. It will uh, make, it will graph their name into uh, eternity, yeah, to put it nicely. So they will be remembered well because they take the breath step. Yeah. So it's a, a big combination of uh, economic and uh, shrink and as psychologists, yeah. So you, you have to convince them on, and there is uh, a grassroots uh, of people that 
uh, demand it yeah, the demand because yeah I mean like for instance the uh, it's always uh, at least for now it's still uh, cheaper to to use coal yeah, for the power plant yeah. so it's still uh, it's still more expensive to to use the the renewable yeah. so you have to convince them uh, with uh, people support with the yeah with scientific and empirical data yeah that the the price is declining and you have to give them uh, money yeah so so there's the 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 yeah, the money that the financing that can be channeled by from international agency from uh apa, from green bonds yeah from uh it is help a lot yeah it it help convince the the policymaker to to yeah, to make the change yeah and lastly yeah as i put on my last slide is is the perception yeah uh, put expectation on them yeah put expectation yeah so uh, that if they not uh, taking the step, yeah, they are left behind. They are uh, failing the the global public expectation. Yeah, so uh, like I say, it it require a lot of uh, effort, yeah, to make them change the calculation. Yeah, because after all, the, the policymaker, the minister, prime minister, uh, president are uh, have a, need to have the political sense. Yeah, so if uh, the the both are aligned, yeah. The yeah, the economic calculation is still doable, is still beneficial to the country in in quite near future, not too far distant. And the political and the public support is with them, and uh, many will take the step. Yeah. So it's a it's a good cup with a bad cup strategy that uh, yeah, each of the each of us in each country we know the situation the actor better, but uh, you have to make sure that. Uh, all of the step, all of the uh, front line are being uh, taken care of. Yeah. So, so they will not take the short-sighted uh, cheaper first. Yeah, cheaper first, cheaper now first. Yeah. So we 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 make them. You are a legend in the future if you take the step. You know. I think. Yeah, that's what's uh, at least partially behind the calculation of Indonesia president in 2009, Pak uh, Yudhoyono, and also partially in the back of the mind of the current president, Pak Jokowi, that he changed, have a, make a big, uh, big U-turn uh, in a policy into uh, more green and sustainable. Thank you, Pak Belly. And, and I think uh, there's one question which I would like to, to reframe, uh, because you also mentioned about, you know, political you know political process and and is that is that how you would you know you would share with, to other developing countries to to win the political support over such a you know, commitment like net zero all of these calculations all of these you know short-sighted uh, avoiding the short-sightedness of of you know, you know planning etc et but you know you you know in if if in one minute what can you share uh, to the other colleagues in developing countries on how to 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 secure that po domestic political support for such a great uh, ambition. Yeah, uh, to short word, I think uh, Greta and Tesla. Yeah, yeah. Greta is the, yeah, the sound of the youth. Yeah, make them heard, mm -hmm. make them give them platform. Yeah, to to voice out their demand or their, their concern. Yeah, so they are ready to willing to, to to pay more and put effort. Yeah, for for the future because it's their future. The second is Tesla. So being green is cool. Is we're being green is uh, bring investment. Yeah. So Indonesia has been toying, has been persuading, has been trying to invite Tesla to invite Indonesia to invest in Indonesia for so many years. Is so is the but uh, is their demand that Indonesia switch into more green? Yeah, reduce the yeah the coal power, reduce the emission and uh, pollution. Yeah, partly that uh, I think play play the part that Indonesia uh, very recent change of strategy. So you need to make it both way. You need to have the the, the carrot, the stick, and sometimes the pitchfork. As well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Obviously. Uh, situations will be different, but that's that's actually what works in Indonesia. So thank you very much uh, for that insights. And um, for the participants, uh, yes, this session is uh, recorded. I've been told by the um, uh, the organizer by the SDSN that this session is recorded and will be made available on the web, so you can uh, revisit and uh, perhaps download if 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 needed. Um, with that, uh, we are on time. So I'd like to thank. 
once more to Olga and Paberli for your wonderful insights. Um, also, um, virtually thank uh, to Phoebe uh, for her presentation as well. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation, uh, audience from all over the world. I, I've I've seen many from coming from joining from Africa, and um, I hope I, I can see you again and and talk to you again. Good afternoon and good morning. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you very much, uh, Pavelni. Thank you very much.